and it is a pleasure to be with you folks today. Some of you I have known for a long time, many of you I do not know, I know that, but uh, this is a special church as Les alluded to. Um, partly I, I mentioned this last evening, for a number of years while my daughter was a student here, this was her home church and you folks um, poured your love into her and that's bearing fruit in this day. Also, uh, just people who have shared my life. And even, I often think of this, even with Pastor Les, uh, before I knew him, I knew of him. I was friends with his sister at university at Mount Allison, and she used to talk about her brother pastoring out on the prairies, I think it was, or somewhere in Western Canada. And I just remember that, how God weaves our stories together. Um, and we had a great time last night. And I love being in this church and what God is doing in your midst, and happy anniversary to you, 128 years. And that seems like a long time on one hand, but I was just thinking after I asked your pastor just to confirm the, uh, what anniversary it was. And yet on another hand, some of you, it's conceivable that some of you here today could have known people who were here when the first church started. We, we tend not to think like that, but 128 years, you know, round that off to to 130 years, that's, you know, two 65-year lifetimes. So it's conceivable that someone could have been 10 years old when this church started, and some of you as children could have known them in their senior years. And it's not that long, and God's been at work here, and, and I get, when I walked in here, you know, I don't know if it's of the Lord or just my own kind of desires for this church, but that one day this, I look at those seats in the balconies on either side, and that this place could be filled again as people seek the life that is found in Jesus Christ. And I think that's what we have to have vision towards. I'm excited as, uh, as your new pastor will be arriving sometime in the next year. I do not know him particularly well. I know his brother quite well. And if uh, being part of the same tree, so to speak, I'm excited for what that future could be for you. And you've been blessed as a church family. I was thinking of the richness of the teaching that you have in terms of Pastor Les and um, Matt and, and others who have poured into you. You truly are a blessed people. Um, I could fill the time. Those of you who know me know I could really do this with small talk. Um, but I do want to bring greetings to you. This isn't small talk. As your pastor alluded to, you're part of a family and I bring family greetings to you on behalf of your sister churches who make up this mission partnership called the Canadian Baptists of Atlantic Canada, um, and also uh, from those who serve in leadership on our behalf. So our president this year, Reverend Wayne Murphy from Lancaster Baptist Church in St. John, and our executive minister, Dr. Peter Reed. Um, and I want to talk with you about a particular emphasis that we are inviting and calling churches to. I have a passion, I won't take you all through it, but I have a passion for um, our congregations being all that God calls them to be where they're at. And I believe the wonderful thing about congregational life is we never have to feel like, well, we're such and such an age, so our future is short. God is always bringing his renewal. And that's what he's desiring to do. And some and many of our most fruitful or vibrant congregational witnesses in Atlanta, Canada are churches that have had long, um, long histories, relatively speaking. Uh, and they continue to be making significant impact for the kingdom where they're at. Um, one of our initiatives, and I want to talk, you'll see even in the bulletins you received this morning on the way in, is um, about... Uh, markers of a mission edge. And I want to talk about what that means as we encourage churches to be living into that kind of paradigm. And that's where I want to be going. And our, as for scripture this morning, I want to incorporate it into the message because I think it'll appear uh, on our PowerPoint presentation within a few minutes. But first, I want to tell you about a story that you might have heard um, this summer on the news. It, came, it happened in Cornwall, Ontario. Um, it happened to be an elderly lady, this happened to, but it could have been any of us. In fact, I will tell you a little story that when I rent cars, I always know what make of car I rent, but sometimes I've gone out looking for the car in a parking lot and I can't remember what color it is. Um, 
But this lady had gone into her enterprise agency needing to rent a car for a couple of weeks, and she rented a black Nissan Sentra four-door sedan. As she was picking up the car, the helpful attendant explained that this was a keyless car with a push-button start, and all she needed to do was to ensure that she kept the key fob with her within her purse, and she'd never need to kind of stop and fumble to fish it out. Her first stop that day after picking up the car was to uh, go to her local Walmart, and she did that, and then she just carried on doing her thing for the next couple of weeks before returning the car. Now, as she was using the car, she realized, she said, um, that it was beginning to dawn on her that the car wasn't in very good condition for being a rental car. Um, she noticed that uh, uh, it hadn't been cleaned very well, and when she opened up the trunk, she even found they had overlooked and left a set of golf clubs in the trunk of the car. The attendant entered the license plate number, or sorry, um, and so when she was taking the car back to the dealer after the couple of weeks, she began to give the employee a piece of her mind, telling them that she sure wasn't very impressed with their service. The car they gave her hadn't been, as I alluded to, very clean at all, and she told them about, you know, the golf clubs in the trunk. The attendant apologized. He said, I don't know how that would have happened. He uh, entered the license plate of the car into their computer, and he said to her, well, ma'am, we never rented you that car. Now, she interpreted this as merely being another example of their gross incompetence. They most certainly had rented her the car. Did they think she was senile and didn't know where she had rented the car from? Why, the key fob even had the enterprise tag right on it. And the employee pointed out that the key fob was for a Nissan. And whereas she was returning with a black four-door infinity sedan. Now, I guess I had pictures up here, but I can't see. Maybe that they're not able to have the presentation working. The manager was called over, um, and they began to piece together what had happened because he recalled hearing of a black infinity being stolen from a nearby Walmart two weeks before. And so the manager and the woman, together, they drove over to the Walmart, and there they found the pristinely clean black Nissan Sentra sitting exactly where she had parked it two weeks before. They contacted the police, and the story began to come together. What happened was that as the owner of the Infinity was getting out of his car that day to run into the Walmart, he happened to drop his key fob and it slid down into the nether regions under the driver's seat, and he wasn't able to retrieve it. Figuring he'd only be a couple of minutes, he decided just to leave the car unlocked, ran into the store, and that he would fish out the key later. Upon his return, however, the car was gone. He reported the car stolen, and after two weeks of hearing nothing, he figured it was long gone to some chop shop or other. So, of course, no charges were filed, thankfully. The elderly woman, she pro apologized profusely for her mistake, and the gentleman was just happy to have his car back, no worse for the wear, with his golf club still in the trunk where he had left them. So why do I tell you that story? It's kind of an interesting story. You know, we can relate to this lady. I know all the time when we rent cars, even it happened yesterday, my wife or my child will go up to another car waiting to get into it, uh, thinking it's the car we have. But I tell you, because as I reflected on this story, I thought how often we as churches can be like this lady, you know, as she for two weeks drove around in the wrong car, kind of oblivious to what was really going on. Um, she knew in this way, she knew something wasn't quite right, but she figured that whatever was wrong must have been someone else's fault or issue. It couldn't possibly be hers. It must have been the rental agency's fault that the car was so dirty and that the golf clubs had been left in the trunk, that the attendant was obviously so incompetent um, to think that the car hadn't been rented uh, from them. Not once she had she really began to consider that maybe she was the one who had, was mistaken or misinformed within some of her assumptions. 
And I don't say this harshly. I love the local church. I'm blown away with what our churches are doing. But, but I think at times we just have to kind of keep asking ourselves, where can we be prone to these kind of things? And are there times when we ourselves confuse our identity and our calling, our mission, our reason for existence, when we make it about things that it was never really ultimately meant to be about? An example that illustrates this as well as any is the guy who recently explained to his pastor why he was no longer attending that church. And, and this was what he said. This pastor told me this in the last month or two, because he, he said, I'd gone to visit this guy, no longer attending our church. And the guy said, well, I'll tell you why I'm no longer attending your church. Your church used to be a church that knew the difference between an eighth note and a quarter note. But it no longer knows that. And so I'm not going anymore. Now, I'm all about music and, and, and excellence, and I mean, we're so blessed. You guys are so blessed musically. But we always have to know, what is the mission for our church? Recognizing the utmost important for, importance for churches to properly grasp and embrace and live out their true God-given identity and mission, the CBAC is inviting churches to, to become Mission Edge churches. We're still putting this together and, and preparing resources that over time, we just want to begin to prepare the, the field, so to speak, prepare, develop awareness of this term of what Mission Edge is about. It's not significantly different than from when we were using the missional church uh, conversation, but we do find that the churches are resonating with this notion of what it is for us to be Mission Edge in the communities where we are. As a working group, as we worked on this within our CBAC office, we came up with a definition. And the formal definition that we wrote of a Mission Edge church was this. And no one's going to memorize this, but as you think about it, this kind of gives us some direction and understanding. The definition was that a Mission Edge church is a church displaying the good news of Jesus in both word and in deed in its local community in ongoing, relevant, and contextual ways for its locality. And we could unpack all of that, but we're not to be just a, a, a series of franchise churches looking the same in every community. Every church is unique. Every community is unique. What's it mean for us, given who we are, to be displaying the good news in word and in deed in a relevant way within the community we're in? These churches are also seeking to reach into their neighborhoods and networks all over the world. So our responsibility is not only to our immediate neighborhoods, but from there it emanates out into the whole world through demonstrating and proclaiming the good news of Jesus. Mission Edge really is about being the presence of Jesus in our neighborhoods and in our world by emulating Jesus' example. Again, I want you to understand, it's not that we think churches aren't seeking to do this. We want to add wind into their sails in doing this. So I always worry that it's, because there is a trend lately. I don't know if you've noticed it. My, I was talking about it with my brother and his wife at breakfast this morning. That a lot of church leaders dump on churches. I don't want you to think I'm dumping on you. In fact, again, I'll tell you, I am... I always feel I'm on holy ground in a special way when I gather with congregations throughout Atlanta, Canada. But we do want to be, if you will, adding wind to the sails in the direction that churches are seeking uh, to be living out this good news. But it is about being the presence of Jesus in our neighborhoods and world by emulating his example. We are the body of Christ in the world today. But let's look to Romans 15 as we read from the message, the example Jesus has set for us in this sort of way. So beginning at verse 1, <clears throat> those of us who are strong and able in the faith. So that's you and I, if, if, if you are here as a believer, and many of you probably would be like me, would think of if you're of a certain age, and you know that you've been journeying for either many years or maybe even many decades in your walk with Christ. And, and we're not saying we've arrived and we're the strong ones, but we're the ones who have this legacy, this, this, um, this heritage of walking with Christ. Those of us who are strong and able in the faith, 
We need to step in and lend a hand to those who falter. Now that can be a couple of things. That can be one of our own from within who struggle along the way. That applies there. That can also apply to all those in the community around us who have never had the opportunity to know of the life that is found through Jesus Christ. But pay attention to these next words, and not just do what is most convenient for us. That is a place where many of us as Christians and as churches struggle. That we assess things in terms of what is convenient or comfortable for us personally, more so than will it make us effective in the mission that we're called to do. So Paul says those of us who are strong and able in the faith need to step in, lend a hand to those who falter, and not just do what is most convenient for us. Paul says strength, this, heris, this um, legacy, this heritage, is for service, not status. Each one of us needs to look after the good of the people around us, asking ourselves, well, how can I help? And then Paul says that's exactly what Jesus did. He didn't make it easy for himself by avoiding people's troubles, but waded right in and helped out. I love the the imagery of that, and that's why this message is called Wading Right In. Jesus um, waded right in and helped out. I took on the troubles of the troubled, is the way Scripture puts it. And even if it was written in Scripture long ago, You can be sure it's written for us. And then Paul says this, God wants the combination of his steady, constant calling, his calling to us personally, his calling to us as a corporate body together. He wants that that combination of his steady, constant calling and his warm personal counsel in Scripture. I just love the beauty of that understanding of what Scripture is about, his his warm personal counsel in Scripture. He wants those two things to come to characterize us, keeping us alert for whatever he, God, will do next. And that's a theme we talk about, joining God in the neighborhood, understanding God is at work, and we're looking, in a sense, to merge into what God is doing. And then Paul says, May our dependably steady and warmly personal God develop maturity in you. And here's the picture of maturity that Paul gives us. It's not how many verses we can memorize and, and recite. Not that that's not important. Of course it is. But here's the picture of maturity, that we get along with each other as well as Jesus gets along with us all. And then we'll be a choir. Not our voices only, but our very lives singing in harmony in a stunning anthem to the God and Father of our Master Jesus. We just heard beautiful um, songs here, anthems, and that's what we are before the watching world as we live in harmony with one another in the mission that God has called us to. Jumping down to verse 15, um, Paul says this, I'm simply underlining how very much I need your help in carrying out this highly focused assignment God gave me. And you can know this, if God gave Paul a highly highly focused assignment, we also have this highly focused assignment. And what is our assignment? It is this priestly and gospel work of serving the spiritual needs of the outsiders. Putting the needs of the outsiders even ahead of our own needs. Now, within the context, and if you understand the time of this, it's about taking the gospel to the non-Jewish outsiders. But the theme, the principle, remains the same, so that they can be presented as an acceptable, acceptable offering to God, made holy and holy by God's Holy Spirit. So that's the example we're called to emulate as a local church, of wading right in, to reach out in a special way to those who are as yet spiritual outsiders. But then we began to think as we thought of all this, well, what would a Mission Edge church look like? How, what, what kind of a direction should these churches be looking to be living into? And so to answer that question, we identified six markers or six elements 
that we believed would be common to any Mission Edge church. We don't know if it's the end all and be all, but we think it covers many of the bases. And I want to highlight these six markers to you, but first I want to tell you that although uh, we didn't list them in any particular order, I kind of wish, and I think in our next printing of this, um, I kind of wish that we placed the last one first as I think it informs and makes sense, really, of the other five. And so even this morning, I want to identify that one first. So that last marker on your card, but which I want to identify first, is that a Mission Edge Church embraces both the gathering and the scattering expression or nature of the church. A Mission Edge Church, and I touched on this very briefly last night, understands that the church is always pulsing, if you will, like a beating heart. Contracting, expanding. Contracting, expanding. Gathering, scattering. In contracting or gathering, the church gathers together like we are this morning for worship, um, for, for, for maybe study, for fellowship, for mission, whatever that case may be. And, but in expanding, in scattering, it spreads out or pulses into the community as you, the people, go about uh, go into your homes and to your workplaces and your recreational activities. That the church is there wherever you go as well. I told the story last night in my, when I pastored in Moncton. I had a lady who once told me of a ministry she was involved with or a service within the community. And she said, it's exactly where the church should be. And she said, just breaks my heart that the church isn't there. And I said, explain what you mean explain to me what you mean by that. And she said, well, I'm there, but the church isn't there, and the church should be there. And I said, but I thought you told me you're there. And she said, yeah, like, I think she was getting exasperated with me. She said, I'm there, but the church isn't there. And I said, what I'm trying to explain to you is the church is there because you're there. Now, I also understand you could say, I wish more people were there, more resources were being directed to this, but wherever you go, taking care of your grandchildren, um, working. I was talking to Trey last night, who's a librarian. And uh, wherever you go into your life in the um, work week ahead, that's where the church is. Um, there's, there's conversation about embracing the 110, understanding that there's 168 hours in the week. If we're fortunate, maybe we get 48 hours of sleep a week. That takes us down to 120. Maybe we're in our gathered ministry 100 or for 10 hours a week. And then that leaves us 110 hours that we're in our scattered ministry as we pulse into our community, that we're being the church there as much as when we're together. It's heresy to think that the church is only the church when we're gathered together. We're also the church as we pulse out. And that's where your mission field is, wherever you go, and wherever your people go, that is where the church is. So that's the first, or, or the last, marker. A Mission Edge church recognizes and embraces both the gathering and the scattering. The second marker is that of hospitality. A Mission Edge church nurtures and prioritizes and <clears throat> simply lavishes hospitality. Um, this includes everything from how we welcome the newcomer to a service or to a small group or neighborhood, uh, to how we treat someone who reaches out to us for assistance, whether in our gathered stage or as we're out into the community, or how we foster relationships and extend genuine hospitality to our neighbors in our neighborhoods or in our workplaces. It's how we love people is through our hospitality. Hospitality is essential if we want to be building bridges to those who are as yet spiritual outsiders. But, but we shouldn't think of hospitality as simply being an evangelism strategy. More so, we should understand that it's simply to be a reflection of the very likeness of Christ in our lives. Hospitality is about living out that same extravagant love and openness to others which God has first extended to us. So gathering and scattering, hospitality, the third marker of a Mission Edge church that I want to identify is that of the Word. A Mission Edge church embraces its, um, its privilege and its responsibility to be telling the good news in Word. 
And so this applies to a clear and winsome explanation of the gospel and the preaching and teaching ministry uh, of the church, but also every bit as much in the everyday lives of us as followers of Christ. Are we able to explain the reason for the hope that we have in Christ when we're given that opportunity in the coffee shop or visiting with our neighbor or with a colleague at work? Of course, we're not to offensively barge into people's lives with the gospel, banging them over the head with it, so to speak. But most of us have the opposite problem, I find. Most of us don't even know what to say when a clear opportunity is given to us. I spoke on this at Oasis this summer of, of uh, one of our now, our lay pastors, telling me that when he was a spiritual seeker, he worked in his office with people he knew were, were really committed Christians. And he said, I wanted to know uh, what it was they believed. And I would go to them and want to ask them, and they would get all tongue-tied and red-faced, and they would inevitably look to change the subject matter to, you know, the weather or about how the Leafs played last night or whatever it was. And I think we can relate to that. Are we at ease if someone asks us or gives us the, the opportunity to be able to speak of the difference, the night and day difference that Jesus has made in our life? So a Mission Edge church prioritizes the clear telling of the scripture and of the gospel, committed to prioritizing and equipping one another for sharing the good news in word, in unforced, natural, and authentic ways. Gathering and scattering, then, hospitality, word, and the fourth marker is deed. Mission Edge churches do not succumb to an either-or thinking, but rather embraces a both-and. Mission Edge churches are equally committed to demonstrating the gospel through their deeds as they are to telling of it through their words. Deeds, you know, those loving actions, caring behavior, life-creating initiatives, serve to both interpret and affirm the truthfulness and the viability of the gospel message. And like hospitality, we're not to think of deeds as being subservient or secondary to the word nor are we to think of them as substitute to the words. But deeds have their own integrity. They're, they're, um, while we always want to be seeing people come to know the life that is in Jesus Christ, we love also out of obedience, pure and simple. Remembering that, uh, as the words of Scripture tells us, that we entertain angels unaware. And as Jesus said, that whatever we do unto the least of these, we do unto him. We treat others as if they are Jesus in disguise. A Mission Edge church sees loving deeds as equally integral to the life in ministry as is the proclaiming of the word of the gospel. The next uh, marker is that of partnerships. If we want to be joining God in what he is already doing, we have to understand that he is already working in and through others around us. This means we can join in with what they are doing while also inviting them to join in with us. It may be that as a local church, we will want to partner with a local school in offering a hot breakfast program, or we may want to join with Habitat for Humanity in building a, a house in our neighborhood. We may offer as an individual to build props at the local theater or to play the trompone or, or the saxophone in uh, the community orchestra. Or we may similarly invite others to partner with us. In, in my home community of, of Quispamsis in the Kennebecasis Valley, there's a group called the Kennebecasis Valley, the KV Old Timers, a group of retirees. And they go around and they'll partner with groups in helping people. And it could be anything from building a deck for someone who's been disabled by a stroke, or they may um, help you know, um, a, a single mom put a new roof on a house or help a widowed lady get the wood split and put into the house. They do that kind of projects, and they'll partner with various community organizations, including churches and that kind of work. Partnerships multiply, impact, and foster the formation of relationships, realizing that closer relationships allow for more natural opportunities to live the good news of the gospel before our neighbors. And so then the sixth and final marker is that 
Mission Edge churches are committed to understanding the culture of the neighborhoods they're in. Think about it. In the incarnation, in the act of Jesus coming, or of God coming in the person of Jesus, God came to our level. That's the whole story, really, as we approach um, Advent and Christmas. The Word became flesh and dwelt or made his dwelling among us. In other words, he moved into our neighborhoods. He pitched his tent among us. It was God who took the initiative to bridge the gap to where we were. And we are to emulate his example. We need to be going into our neighborhoods, bridging the gap that exists between us and them. We need to become the missionaries that we have expected our missionaries to be for hundreds of years now. I mentioned last night that I was with Dr. John Keith. John's now 86 years old, used to be one of the head guys for Canadian Baptist Overseas Mission Board. And I was asking him, how many languages could he speak? I knew he had worked in various places around the world. And he said, oh, I gotta think about it. And I just said, you know, you can speak fluently or have some measure of a working ability in it. And he, he came back after thinking about it, he said, um, 10. I think I, it's 10 languages I have a working ability in, at least. I mean, that blew me away. But what it also said to me was John understood that language matters. And he knew that missionaries are obliged to learn the language of the culture they're sent to. That it's imperative they work to understand the nuances of that culture. That it's incumbent upon them to find ways to foster trust and relationships with the people they're looking to reach. And as churches in our communities, we need to do the same right where we are. So gathering and scattering, we talked about the last one. And then going to the top, hospitality, word, deed, partnerships, culture. These are the six markers of a church committed to being mission edge. If we want to be joining God in what he is doing in our neighborhoods, what he is doing in us and through us and all around us, then these markers give us direction on how to go about this. I think of them as being like compass markers or horizon markers that help us plot our path. We have a distinct, unique mission as the church, a God-given mission. And we're not to be hijacking or driving some other mission that really doesn't belong to us. And frankly, you know, our mission isn't about eighth notes or quarter notes. Nor is it ultimately about either choir robes or torn skinny jeans, or padded pews or upholstered chairs or worshiping on Sunday mornings or Tuesday evenings. Our mission is about wading right in, wading right into our neighborhoods, into our networks, into our world, not self-preoccupied with what is most convenient or comfortable for us, but instead wading right in, looking to bridge the gap and entering into the troubles of others out of the desire that those who are yet the outsiders will come to know for themselves God's love and healing and hope and restoration that is found in Jesus Christ. And so as I close, I want to close with these words now from, first, from Peter, from 1 Peter chapter 2, again, as found as they are in the message. These are Peter's, but these are God's words to all of us. You are the ones chosen by God, chosen for the high calling of priestly work, chosen to be a holy people, God's instruments, to do his work and speak out for him, to tell others of the night and day difference he made for you from nothing to something, from rejected to accepted. Let's pray. Lord, for those of us who know what it is to identify you as Lord and Savior. We are a privileged people, God, to know what it means to be loved by the creator of the universe, that you are a merciful God, a forgiving God, a God who, gives, who brings newness. And Father, you, in rescuing us, call us, invite us into your mission of taking the same good news of uh, words of life to the world around us. 
And we pray, God, that you will lead us. I pray that you will lead this congregation in the journey therein. I also want to say, Father, that if there are some here today who are still seeking, and I hope there are, who don't know what they believe, that God, to know that you are a God who comes to us and invites us into a deep and a deep life of wholeness with you, that, Father, there might be that step towards uh, to the next step of seeking that relationship with you, even to the point of surrender and inviting you to come in as Lord and Master of that life. We pray these things all in Christ's name. Amen.